Hello, and welcome everyone to another MyoSound webinar. Uh, today, we're going to need every minute. So without further ado, let's start looking at the keynote. So today is going to be a very special webinar with a very special uh, guest appearance, none other than Tony Miola. Introductions will follow soon. Uh, that being said, for those that have been uh, keeping track of recent webinars, uh, Tony was already mentioned during Bob McCarthy's On Theater Sound a Historical Journey webinar. So if you want to want to know more about the um, historical journey of Bob in the uh, industry of theater sound, be sure to watch that webinar, which can be found on our YouTube channel, Thinking Sound. Um, and that means that we have uh, uh, several co-hosts today, uh, starting with uh, John Menino. John, are you there? I'm here. Yeah. Thanks, Merlin. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. And we have another co-host, which is Bob McCarthy. Bob, are you with us? Uh, I believe so. Testing one, two. Yes, sir. Me? I can hear you loud and clearly. Now, Bob, I think that you would like to kick off with a word of our sponsor, right? Sure, that's fine. Okay, <laughs> here we go. 606 Playbull. I would have to say that I've had the opportunity to work a lot of theatrical shows, uh, many with Tony and many with others. And there's a few shows that you might not have heard of, uh, and specifically in reference to the world of uh, sound and audio. Uh, with this one in particular, it was a big hit, Avenue Q. Um, <clears throat> it has a, a new comedy that recalls the mistakes of our past, one after the other. It has all the suspense of Q-based automation. And uh, next, you might recall Fiddler on the Console, the famous story of a man who has the world under his fingertips but can't leave well enough alone. This one will leave you and the PA howling. It features the hit song, If I Were a Sound Man. You might recall Death of a Sound Man. Uh, the old sound man, that's Willie Low Endman reflects on his future possibilities after mixing 6,000 performances of cats. Uh, Les Misers, a slasher slash uh, slasher thriller that keeps you on the edge of going broke. It's got budget cuts, value engineering, reduced staffing and less. And this has made this the most profitable show on Broadway. Bring on the noise, bring on the moving lights, a truly moving tribute to our senses of sight and sound. It's the buzz of Broadway. Who could forget Sound Man of La Mancha, the dramatic tale of the last great sound engineer as he travels the world in pursuit of the latest fad solution, featuring the hit song, The Impossible Scheme. And of course, a chorus line array. The challenges of directing large quantities of players to work together for a great combined effect. How to succeed on Broadway without really being heard. Let's all whine about the good old days before sound systems. And then let's whine about not being able to hear the word. And then, hey, why is it so loud? And finally, Licked, a tongue-in-cheek musical, the greatest show on Broadway, especially <clears throat> for the investors. And you might say investors like Tony, who took this on not just as sound design, but uh, against, uh, you know, he, he, you would call him the Wizard of Odds. Excellent. So without more, there's Tony. So Tony, are you with us? You're going to let me do all this stuff, huh? That's yes. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Tony. I have to follow Bob McCarthy. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's it, Tony. Thank you so much for kicking off this week for us. Um, sure. uh, we're going to do uh, a week of, uh, of theater and, uh, and that's a great t-shirt <laughs> we can see. Um, so some of you may know Tony's career has uh, spanned uh, many many years, and uh, we're going to uh, we're going to talk this this hour really about um, everything to do with uh, sound design, how 
how he's approached it um, and uh, and look back at uh, at some great years and some great people that were that Tony has been been working with over the years. I think some of some of which I actually saw popping up here online, like H. Um, so uh, so advancing the slides, Merlin, is you or me? I'm happy to take the honors. Great. So, you know, uh, uh, we'll go through a few of these slides first, just kind of show some of Tony's history to warm us up. And then uh, my first question really for Tony is going to be is, um, is to tell us a little bit about your history of going from a mixer to a sound designer and kind of how that evolution happened. That evolution happened in the mid 80s. I was working for Otz for I had been working for Otz Munderloh for six or seven years and um i decided i was going to design my own shows and well the trouble was is that producers thought of me as an operator not as a designer and it was very hard to get work um they um <clears throat> finally i did i did do one broadway show in the early 80s which was a play and it didn't last very long um ned and jack and um, then I got a break in 1987. Jerry Zachs hired me to design Anything Goes with Patti LuPone at Lincoln Center at, at the Vivian Beaumont, a theater that was notoriously known for its bad amplified sound, amplified or otherwise. And um, thanks to John Meyer, who simmed the space for me, um, it was a great success. Not only was the show a success, but I started getting a lot of work as a result. And that's sort of what launched me. Perfect. And that was the first show you used Sim on, which was, uh, you know, one of the questions I had and kind of how that, how that made a difference for, for your designs. Actually it wasn't. Les Mis was the first show with Andrew. Oh, Blue. sorry. And then right. I designed the other companies. And uh, so technically, Les Mis was the first show with Sim, but um, which was just a year before. It was almost following. Was there a show that kind of changed your career, your life? You know, we talked about this a little the other day. And the first show, of course, I mentioned was A Chorus Line. Yeah. Um, but there was another show, and you won't find anything about it online. It was the summer between my sophomore and junior year of college, and I was a music major. I was a clarinetist. I was playing in orchestra pits like I always did in the summer. And I, we were doing Anything Goes, actually. And I was in the orchestra pit, and when we were finishing putting our stuff away, I noticed I was looking at the stage and we were supposed to open the next night and there were no lights hung in the air. So I asked them if they needed help and I hung and focused every light they had. So they made me the lighting designer. And then, mm -hmm. then their stage manager quit. So they asked me if I would stage manage. So I stage managed, I was the lighting designer. And then they asked me to play in the song, Poor Baby, there's this famous clarinet lick that goes throughout this the show they asked me to play that off stage so that show really made me um change my major from music to theater um it also made me realize at ithaca college that i didn't want to spend six hours a day by myself practicing to be the best clarinetist at ithaca college school of music and I'd rather spend those six hours with other people working on a show. So that was that transition. Then, was um, problem? Sorry. Ahead, sorry. No, go ahead, Tony, sorry. No, and, and my, um, shortly after I changed my major, my mentor from my old school said, you can't play in orchestra pits anymore. You have to go to New York City. So I applied at the New York Shakespeare Festival for a summer job as an electrician, and I got it. And, half, and the very first thing they told me was, we can guarantee you work for the whole summer, but only if our new show, A Chorus Line, is a hit. And I went wow. downstairs and joined my 
new friends, the electricians, and I told them that, and they said, oh, don't worry. The show hadn't previewed yet. In fact, I hung lights, some lights for Chorus Line. But then halfway through the summer, and of course, it was a hit, um, halfway through the summer, they needed someone to run uh, sound effects and music tapes on the mobile theater. And I was the only one with sound on my resume because I had worked in a stereo store in high school. So um, that's when I went to the sound world and it clicked. And lucky for me, I went back to school, my senior year of school, having a job at the New York Shakespeare Festival in the, in the summer after I graduated. So uh, that was pretty cool. That's cool, yeah. Was Otz uh, involved in the show when it first previewed? In downtown, no. Abe was the designer and I'm gonna forget his name. The operator was, uh, it was designed and operated by the, Shakes the staff at the Shakespeare Festival. Roger J, I believe, designed it there. And uh, when it moved uptown, Abe Jacob designed it and Otz was the original production sound op. Got it. Um, so one of the questions that uh, has been, uh, uh, you know, kind of through the, this whole, the interesting thing about uh, Chorus Line is how has technology changed in, in what you've seen in sound design today from what things were back in Chorus Line days? Oh, it, it's immense. You know, Chorus Line was done without wireless microphones, for one thing. Right. Um, the shows we did at the Shakespeare Festival in Central Park or on the mobile theater were done with Sennheiser transmitters that came in sets of 12, six low band and six high band. The low bands had antennas like 31 inches long, that really sort of like FM. And you could only really get 10 to work well, nine to work well. So it was really tough. So we did a lot of changing around of of transmitters backstage at the Delacorte. Also, they were gigantic. They took three nine volt batteries a piece. Um, so just think of that today and think of how large, uh, how yeah. not large, not only the transmitters are, but, yeah. um, but uh, the microphones themselves. Um, I didn't realize I was gonna keep getting text on my screen, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, the sound, uh, there, there, there were, yes, in, in the microphones, it just is an incredible, what a difference. I mean, before to have 12, maybe you got 10 to work, you know, and then to do a show in the 90s, the Christmas Carol we did at Madison Square Garden Theater, 6,000 seat theater, we had 55 radios. And um, we didn't, they were all different kinds because nobody had even then couldn't give us 60, uh, 55 of the same, not Vegas or Sennheisers or Shore or whatever. So, and, and, and for playback, I mean, you know, I started on reel to reel and uh, I thought mini discs were an amazing invention. Uh, and, uh, and now look, you, anybody can do anything at home on their computer, right. you know, plug it in, boom, there you go. Not to mention uh, the strides that we've made on consoles, and but really, 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 really loudspeakers. If I might bring up Meyer Sound, and not only loudspeakers but processing. I mean, think of the old digital delays, ever all the noise. The um, it, 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 there's so much. I can't. I don't know. I can't imagine there being in the period since the mid '70s when I started working there being a period of greater advancement, though maybe there will be. Uh, and I can't imagine where that would end up if it advanced as much as it has since the 70s for me. I don't know. So one of the things we're gonna talk about on Wednesday is, uh, is acoustics for theater um, in, in another session. So, but it's one of the questions that we were gonna, we wanted to talk a little bit about, I think in our brainstorming session about noise levels in theaters and acoustics and how that's changed over the years. Maybe you or Bob have any comments on those? You want me to go with? Sure, go ahead, yeah. Um, 
Oh, I just wanted to say something. I remember what I was going to say before. You showed a picture earlier of King and I in a shot of yep. Donna Murphy and... Yeah, let me be able to back up to that. Yeah, if you back up to that, just so you know, see his hair, his wig, that's a wig, and there's a transmitter and a microphone under that. And oh. you see he's completely shaved on the sides. Mm. So thank you, Sennheiser. Wow, the transmitter was inside. still in Yeah, because I didn't inside. want, he, he takes off his jacket at the end um, and uh, flails, right. you know, and uh, I didn't want to see the wire. So, yeah. I mean, and she has one in her wig too, but clearly there's more space. Yeah, wow. <laughs> but okay, so noise levels. Yeah. You know, it's a bell curve for my life. Um, when I started, let's just talk about noise, not acoustics. Mm -hmm. Noise was very low. You had penis in the theater, quiet. Maybe you had noisy ventilation, you know, figure that out, balance the, the fans and stuff so they're even, and usually that would take care of it. Mm -hmm. Then moving lights were invented and color changers were invented and the curve started to go up and up and up and up and up to the point where actors, um, some very famous actors were starting to get annoyed with the level of um, noise on stage. Of course, we knew about it, but uh, there, there, for the longest period of time, there was nothing like, the, a quiet theater was not quiet. It was 10, 15, maybe even 20 dB louder than the silent theater or the theater with just its ventilation. and. Um, then that curve started going down. And I had the honor of a year ago, I ended it, my three year stint as a Tony nominator. So I saw every single Broadway show for three years, three seasons in a row. And it was so wonderful because the shows just got quieter and quieter and quieter and quieter. And it was such a pleasure, such a complete pleasure with um, having LEDs that didn't need those gigantic fans. But also, too, I have to say, the lighting companies, um, I know that theater was a big, it's a big chunk of money for them, but not as big as rock and roll and big concerts and stuff where they don't really care. So they, they did nothing to, um, to try to silence their, um, their, um, the noise in their machines. Though I have to say, a lot of... Um, Lighting designers were very concerned about it, and that's and they started to change because of it. I know Ken Posner on on uh, Wicked certainly was really really helpful in that, and uh, Natasha Natasha Katz, my old friend, also was very aware and did a lot of made a lot of strides to keep it as quiet as she could. I would I would just throw in a couple of of additions to that. Um, one is that the 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 processors, the early processors that came on, the early digital stuff at the time uh, when there wasn't that many moving lights, were the 16-bit processors and even 14-bit uh, DN716s. But they they had only a 96 dB dynamic range, which definitely meant we had to go through all sorts of ordeals to keep the uh, the noise floor. Uh, inaudible in our systems and as we got improved digital stuff our noise floor went way down that's when the noise floor of all of the, the lighting came up and and replaced that anyway which we couldn't do anything about um, interesting though I've been part of a couple of modern productions where the noise floor is creeping back up because there's large-scale projection going on now and even you know now we were replacing a silent uh, piece of uh, drop uh, with an LED wall that's full of fans. Uh, and that can be uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, some, some big time projection out in the house that not properly shrouded can be a, a, a real noise floor recurrence. We actually had um, a rather large, um, let's just say, discussion. My associate, Mark Ewald, who did uh, Wicked in, San Paulo, Brazil for us, 
uh, had to fight and fight and fight to stop them from putting the projections one meter over the console where the where the operator stood. Oh, <laughs> wow! And uh, and of course, <laughs> you know, there was a trip to San Paulo where all of the associate designers went, but they never asked us to go. So he had staked out his claim with none of us there. Wow. So. But, you know, we won. So, Tony, a little bit about um, your your first use of well, getting further into the sim, and your first use of uh, of working with uh, Andrew, and uh, and then we can maybe talk a little bit about some of your associates over the years. Andrew um, and I met. They asked me to after I had already decided I wasn't going to mix shows anymore. And uh, they asked me to do Les Mis, and I really wanted to work with Andrew. I never really met him, and I was looking forward to it. And I had also heard how good the sound was in London. And because of that association, I mean, Andrew was kind. He let me design all the companies that basically that opened in the United States after Broadway. And uh, I was also, Andrew and I were partners in that I was, I did these four autograph sound. Um, but yeah, I learned a ton from Andrew. Um, one of the things that uh, we did then was Andrew liked, and I learned this from him, the sound of the UM1 monitor speaker because of its 60 degree, is that right? 60 degree horn? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, For 40 degrees in practice. 45 to 6, yeah. It was a lot um, uh, more focusable than for what we needed for a UPA. I always used to think, too, that vocals sounded better coming out of that round horn than they did out of the rectangular one. Uh, that could just be me, but... Um, and uh, luckily for us, then Meyer came out with an arrayable version of that loudspeaker. And... Uh, <laughs> which we've used for a very, which we use for a very, very long time, which we still use in some places because thankfully some of these shows have run a very long time. Yeah. Um, before I met Andrew though, I mean, there was just that picture of Mark Menard, the late Mark Menard. Um, in 1985, I did a show called Three Guys Naked from the Waist Down at the uh, Mineta Lane Theater. And Mark was on the props crew, but he had to do this. He had to do a couple of sound moves. We had a wireless microphone that went on and off stage. You had to hand it to an actor and do this stuff. And he was just brilliant. I mean, you know, just working with him one day, you knew he knew what he was doing. And shortly after that, I asked him to assist me on a carousel that I did at the Kennedy Center. And he did the drawings and pulled the show from Mask Sound without me being there. Now, going back a long time ago, you new people going into a shop got a really hard time. It wasn't like the easiest thing to go in and say, I want this, I need this, I need this. You got a hard time from a lot of the old timers, say. And Mark did it brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly. And had a, you know, a great career for years. And, we, the three of us worked together, Andrew, Mark, and I worked together a lot on Les Mis, I mean, as, as a group, so I miss him. I really miss him. Yeah. And that's Scott Anderson, great operator, who I haven't seen in years, actually. Yeah. yeah. And so you, and you've collaborated with, a, you've had a lot of, a number of associates over the years. Uh, this was, uh, I think, a, a fun picture that, of, uh, of one day working on, uh, on a sim machine where the ribbon cable came loose, right? That is correct. And if those who are watching that know me know this is not a usual thing to see me do is take open up a sim machine and think I could fix it. Luckily, I got very lucky that day and found it right away. Well, that's what you call not a short day. That makes it a long day. A long day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, there's the ultra monitor, of course. Mm -hmm. um, 
and of course, then the UPA. This is a picture from Helen's office of the the, the very first UPA, 1980. <laughs> and there's Ots. There's Ots. What can I say about Ots? You know, there's there's I can count on one hand um, the people who have taught me the most in my life, and he's certainly one of them. Uh, Ots is. Um, one of the smartest people I know. And he also taught me about the relationship that a sound, the, the sound department designer operators. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't want to turn that off. Sorry. Um, he, you can't, sound isn't just in the theater, it's not just wires and cables and microphones and consoles and speakers. It is getting the choreographer to not have the star dance 64 bars before their big song, or the director to keep people facing kind of downstage so you can kind of make it sound natural, or having the orchestrator not put three trombones under a vocal. And, and it's stuff like that. And Ott's taught me all that stuff about how, um, how it's really, I think he used to do um, a little lecture called My 11 Bosses in the Theater and, you know, right down through. And uh, so it's, it's always a game of, of, uh, of getting what you want, but making others think that they're all getting what they want too, even though those things might be different. Um, so that's, you know, odds is, just brilliant. What That's else? Awesome. Can I yeah. I also, though, Otz also thoroughly believes in live, you know, having the sound come from an actor. And I learned that from Otz, and I believe that too. So, yeah. 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 There's Mark. And there's Mark. Yeah. Um, and one, obviously, one of the uh, later, uh, one of the co founders of Acme, right? Right. With Nevin. Yeah. Um, and then some associates, I think, or no, Gary Stocker. You, uh, Gary Stocker is... was the number two, A2 on Les Mis originally. And uh, I was thinking about more things like Gary. Gary is the one who came up with this thing. You know, when you, in those days when you send, you had to unplug all these cables and then plug them into the SIM machine. And then when you went back, you had to unplug all the cables. And Gary came up with this very simple thing of mounting multi-cable multi cables on panels and it just was a clink 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 and it was done in five minutes not even and uh but the only thing on Les Mis it was one of the first shows well the turntable on Les Mis was automated it wasn't in London there was literally a guy with a variac going to Mark's um, but they did it was a hydraulic turntable and it was run by a computer and every time the turntable screwed up, I lost my A2 because none of the carpenters knew anything about computer automation on stage. So, but I say that lovingly. Gary was wonderful to work with and still is. Yeah, and he's still doing, he's still solving, solving challenging problems at mass now. No, oh, he's amazing. Um, and then I think some associates like Jason and Jordan Jason um, was my, I don't even remember the years, was an assistant of mine for a long time. And uh, he couldn't live in New York. And he, he went back to Colorado and he was a ski bum. He taught skiing at Steamboat Springs for a long time. But he also did, I believe, the Muni in the summer. And uh, the Muni oh, yeah. in the Louis. summer. And uh, Jason's just a great guy. And when I was doing hunchback in berlin my associate kai actually broke his leg during a dinner break when when my operator told me about this i thought he was joking so in the middle of production i lost kai to a badly broken leg from rollerblading and getting a rollerblade caught on a tram track or something Ugh. and disney was nice enough to fly Jason in from Colorado to replant. Jason was 
gracious enough to be able to, to help us out, which was terrific. Um, Jordan Pankin, just can't say enough. Um, Jordan, and, Jordan, is, Jordan and I have done more shows. Had, Jordan's mixed more shows for me than anybody else. And uh, we've been together since Annie 2 um, in 1990. 1990, something like that. And he's currently one of the three on uh, Wicked New York. In fact, he's currently driving across the country to see his brother in California. And that's wow. Josh, Josh Mazel, who's also terrific, who's our number one in New York, holds the pink contract. And um, great, great guy, great, great guy. The guy on the right in that picture is not so wonderful, but the other two. <laughs> This is Mark, who I talked about earlier. Mark uh, was so helpful. I mean, helpful is too light of a word. We were doing four new Wicked's in three months, and I didn't have Kai. Excuse me. And Mark was our number one in Holland. He's German, but he lives in Holland with his Dutch wife and child now. Um, and he did certainly did Mexico City and San pa uh, we did the four were um, the tour in the UK starting in Manchester then uh, Mexico City Auckland New Zealand and uh, Seoul South Korea Seoul. Yep. and mm -hmm. uh, Mark was just brilliant and in a few of those cities helping me it was great he's great And then, of course, Kai Harada. What can I say? The only thing I had to teach Kai was how to get up in the morning. <laughs> he was late for our very, he was late for our very first day of orchestra in the pit on Christmas Carol. And, and that was the last time I, I, I guess I was pretty firm, but he never, never was late again. Yeah. So, you know, obviously Wicked has been hugely successful um, and uh, has companies worldwide, as you've been talking about. Um, Bob McCarthy and I have both helped out in many of the sim tunings over the sh on these shows over the years. Um, and I remember, Tony, talking to you one day at Meyer Sound. I think the show was coming to San Francisco or was just getting, they were, you were in prep for, um, uh, for, Start of rehearsals uh, at the Curran, I believe. Um, and uh, I remember you commenting on what a great book the show had and felt it was going to do well. Um, did you have any, any, any idea that it was going to become the success that it has been? Uh, you know, it astounds me. It absolutely astounds me. Um, not, I, I mean, that it run, run, it's running so long is fantastic. What, but I always liked it. And, and I'm not saying, cause I've liked plenty of shows and invested in plenty of shows that tanked. But um, I always, I, the, from the first read through I saw, I just thought it was such a great story of, of um, you know, these two, this relationship between these two women that was just brilliant. And um, Wicked has done very well. And until this recent, let's just call it a pause, uh, it's thought that um, we could run an, another, it's thought that we, a year ago they said we were midway in how long London and New York would run. So. Okay. I think that's pretty good considering we opened 17 years ago. Uh, wow. it, what's really funny is when <laughs> it's, it's so hard to believe because you look at some of these pictures and geez, I was in my forties then I'm going to be 66 this year. <laughs> when did that happen? See, this is the Pantages theater. That's crazy. I just, I, I love this picture. It just, what um, theater was this in? I think the Pantages. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I took the I took the picture. It is the Pantages oh. in Los Angeles. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that hair too. 
I'm, I'm not referring to Kai's. <laughs> Before it went great. I had I had Wicked all figured out that okay it's really good and it's going to do really well in the United States but that's the only place that it can do well because it's it's the prequel to Wizard of Oz which is a distinctly American you know the house in Kansas the whole thing it's a very American story I had no idea that it would translate uh, beyond the U.S. and even uh, <laughs> way beyond across the whole world it's just been amazing. Yeah. Me too, Bob. Um, you know, it's I w in, when it was early on. It must have been previews. Uh, my friend Jean Yves from Paris was in town, and he came to see it, and he loved it. And he'd never seen The Wizard of Oz, and that's when mm -hmm. I thought, hmm, uh, because all of those certain little jokes throughout the show um, are, you know, like when they say, "What's in the punch? Apples and lemons and pears." Oh my, um, we all get that. But right. <laughs> I love watching the show in London because nobody laughs. <laughs> A couple of people here and there, certainly not in the other countries that we've played. But uh, yeah, um, stories, you know, a good story is a good story. So. Has there been other jokes that, that translate well, like in Korean or Dutch or Japanese um, that? You know, audiences audiences are, are so different like take japan the first time when i was doing lion king there there was no nothing maybe a little applause after a number but no real laughter no nothing and then at the bows they never stopped applauding and they start applauding in time and they never stop it's the craziest thing and it's similar in germany um and uh you know i have to say um london crowds are a little quieter than new york crowds uh canadian crowds are a little quieter but they're all usually the same at the end they stand up they scream they holler they buy more tickets they they keep some of us you know, alive. <laughs> and now you're showing a picture of Zach Williamson. Yeah, I mean, what the interesting thing is that Kai's now become, you know, he's doing uh, a lot of great sound design work right. um, and uh, traveling, you know, busy with work when we're not through this pandemic. Um, and uh, and your, your associates are on the show have evolved, right? Oh yeah, I don't have associates anymore. <laughs> they're all, or, yeah, they're the all doing, doing their own stuff. Yeah, um, Zach, Zach saved me on a show where we had to fire the sound op, and my assistant took over. And Zach came in Zoom and just uh, was brilliant. And uh, he's great. He's since moved to Vermont, and he's got tons of things going, but he's now our current American associate on Wicked. Yeah, I talked to him once in a while. It's fun, yeah. And, here, and H I got to meet in, in the UK once. Here's H, what can I say? Um, H has been with Wicked. Uh, he came in one year after we opened, which was in 2006, I think. And uh, he's also fab and he also, does the the supervising of all the companies like um the tour and other things and he's um a fantastic mixer and he would also be a fantastic designer if he chose to do that i'm sure yeah, and he's him. got an amazing sense of humor as they all do i should say yeah do you want to talk a little bit about the separation of the systems at, on Wicked and how that how that was designed? You know, I think this goes back to two things. One, that I like the sound after doing Les Mis, well, during doing Les Mis, I like the sound of vocals coming out of one kind of speaker. And that was, you know, the UM horn. And um, I like the orchestra coming out of a UPA better than a UM. So um, I started 
separating the system. Sometimes, you know, depending, you bleed a little of one into the other. But um, I also like to have the sound come from the performer as much as I possibly can. And if you look on either side, oh, there you go. On either side of the dragon, there are line arrays. And uh, <laughs> it's a, that position balanced with front fills and a little from the lower sides brings the image down, but keeps it on stage. And the orchestra, there's actually two UPAs in the orchestra pit in New York that come up, that are facing up so that the quieter instruments like the strings and the woodwinds can be boosted there as much as the brass sound live so that you get, you can, excuse me, the speakers on the side reinforce that, but it also, the image comes from the orchestra pit. I cannot stand it if I go to a show and, and the orchestra starts playing and they're coming out of a box on the wall over there and the orchestra is there. Um, yeah. So. But imaging is so important, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, and you've kind of evolved so in terms say, of systems. Yes. That's New York, which has um, UPMs. No, what are they called? <laughs> so what's the, the UM one. The, the UPA? No, what? The, the, the name. Oh, uh, UPA 2P. 2P, right. Yeah. Th those are not. Those are UPM. Those are UPA ones in their lower or upper orchestra on Wicked New York. That I can't see where that is on the thing. They're lower. Those are leopards, which we just, whoop. That is, if you stop on one, I'll describe it. <laughs> <laughs> Those are four new leopards that replaced M2Ds on London. This is uh, something that, like I t talk about when I was talking about advancements in sound, I can't believe that stuff like leopards and Lena's can sound so much better than stuff that I thought was the best before. I, I really, I mean, and when we changed, because I was too nervous to do the whole thing at once. We first did the vocal orchestra system. Bob, do you remember? Well, we, we first changed out the, the old analog processing for- Well, for, that was uh, stage one. Earlier. Yes, and then, then we changed out vocal system and then music, yeah. Right, and the vocal system, when we put Lena's in instead of, um, M1Ds, the, the difference was incredible. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when yeah. we replaced the M2Ds with the Leopards, and then we had the whole thing with new loudspeakers, literally people would come up to the sound console and say how good the sound was. And our director, Joe Mantello, noticed it. And it was, re I mean, really, it boggles my mind how a product that I thought couldn't be made better, got made better. And I'm not just plugging Meyer Sound. This is all, I mean this. It's, yeah. it's incredible. There's a lot of advances. And, and it, you know, it's a lot. When you have something that's working, you know, if it works, don't fix it. And that's the way I sort of felt about changing over to newer loudspeakers in London first. I know, yeah. And it, right. Bob convinced me. So thanks, Bob. Awesome. Um, so the, well, there's the upper music system, right? Which we, you talked a bit about. That's uh, oh, those the are the UPAs, point. right? At the Gershwin, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you want a little, you mentioned this book, The Alchemy of Theater. Yes. Uh, you want me to tell the story? And, about it? Yeah, this has, a, a, I guess, something else special on page 22. Uh, 120. 124, I think. 124, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, this, Robert Viagas, who is a writer for Playbill, not Playbull, Playbill, um, asked, called me one day and said, would you, um, I'm writing a book and would you come down and talk to me? I said, sure. And, you know, I talked to him for a couple of hours and 
I thought I was going to be in this book about Broadway with lots of designers and lots of directors and lots of actors and all that. And that's what I thought the book was. Well, a year or so later, this box of a dozen books arrives in my apartment and there's only one of each person. And I was the sound designer and I had no idea. So I was very honored, of course. And, um, and uh, so yeah, get this book, it's really good. But I'm also happy that I, my, some colleagues that I adore are also like Chita Rivera, who, you know, if a performer is really great and they're really great to work with, I, I rate them all from Cheetah. So, you know, if, if, if they're up near Cheetah, they're really great. And, yeah. and, and also the incredible Paul Gemignani, who is the best musical director in the world and um, gets sound and gets balance. And he will balance the orchestra in the, re in the studio before they come into the orchestra pit. And he will then balance the orchestra in the orchestra pit before we turn a microphone on. Because he knows that if the keyboards are too loud, we're just gonna have to bring everything up around the keyboards. He knows, you know, he, he uses dynamics. And um, so many people think that, so many musicians think you don't need dynamics because it's all done at the console. But, but it, if you want to keep it real, and believe me, the, the best thing we can do in the theater is real, real voices and real musical instruments and an interaction between a live audience and a live, live performers, it, there's nothing like it. And the more we put in between that, you know, is I think we take away from our greatest asset. And, um, and working with Paul Gemignani is just the best thing in the world. And Kiss Me Kate, we did Kiss Me Kate in 1999. And he, it, it just sounded great. And it sounded really natural. Mm -hmm. And I was really proud of it. We got good mentions all over. And, uh, and it was just a lovely, lovely collaboration as we've done many times. Most recently, um, Oh, I don't even know most recently. But. So we're going to open this up to questions now. Um, uh, does, you know, please, um, Merlin, do you want to give them the kind of the rundown on, on chatting a question out? Sure. If you want to ask any questions to the uh, um, to fellow panelists, uh, be sure to make use of Zoom's uh, chat function. Uh, please enter your question into the chat and then I will read it out loud for everyone uh, to hear. So yeah, while people have a chance to to type in their questions, Tony, uh, just I wanted to go back to since you kind of just finished with this, talk a bit more about imaging and you know how important that's been for 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 you. You you know you touched on it a little bit um, on localizing the actor and localizing music. I will, but I just wanted you guys to know that that text yeah. was I don't have to do that thing. I have to do at one. So oh okay okay we can keep going. Um, well, imaging just plays into what I just said about real. Um, and, and to get that, you have, to, you have to go into the performer's dressing room if they're, you know, you have to take notes for actors, little, you know, and, and, and tell them when they're not being loud enough. If, if they can get to the fourth or fifth row with their own voice, I can get them to the back of the balcony sounding pretty natural. And um, so it's, it's a lot of work with, with actors, with directors. It, it, it isn't all just, you know, where to put the speakers. That has a lot to do with it, of course. Mm -hmm. But, and it's, you know, how much, Bob, you and John certainly know how much I fuss with the front fills and the overheads and the sides, you know, in the good seats down front, which are the hardest to amplify, by the way. Um, uh, to try to to try to keep that image uh, toward the center of the stage, because if you can get it towards the center of the stage, then an actor with enough presence, enough projection, um, will take care of the left to right bit. Do you know? 
you know, I don't want to somebody turning a balance thing back and forth. It's just a little too much because um, in the theater, I want the actor to control more of the directionality than us. Um, yeah. I, a lot of people don't do that, but that's what I do. So, One of the fortunate things is that actors are still analog. And as a result, they're, you know, they tend to have zero latency. And that is a big advantage to us because that gives you uh, the, the time part is always in their favor. Um, once they go digital, we're going to be really screwed. So we have Some of the instruments have already. <laughs> we go have ahead, Christopher. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's that's all okay. Uh, we have Christopher Dean uh, raising his hand, so I'm um, asking him um, to enter his message in the chat, and he's asking how much has console automation changed sound design? Mm. Well, a lot. Um, automation first. When I mixed Lame Is. The, uh, originally, there were 17 radio mics. A lot of them changed all during the show, but um, there was no no VC, VCAs. It was just you had to mix every fader plus four orchestra faders. So um, that's a huge difference. Um, just moving to a console that has VCAs and being able to program who's going to be on this one at this time was a huge difference. And now. With newer consoles, with completely computerized consoles, they're basically the same thing, only they do so many, they have so many more possibilities of inputs and outputs and matrixing that, that we never could do, say, on a CADEC. But shout out to old CADECs. We still have an old CADEC in New York, and we still have an old CADEC in London. And I've done shows with a digital console and all digital equipment, and I still like the sound of the CADEC. Thank you, Tony. Um, somebody else rose his hand, Pedrak um, Adamovich, and um, he is asking, have you used any kind of voice lifting or tracking? Tracking. We, in the theater, we call that click track. And yes, uh, it's only, it, we're only able to use what actors equity will let us. And we don't, do it to fake anybody out. We do it because uh, if you take, if you've seen the Lion King, the Stampede, those actors have these heavy costumes on and shields and they're moving like crazy and they've got to sing. And it's really hard to, to sing out loud when you're really working strenuously. So that is one of the places in the Lion King that's trapped. Now there's a, in Wicked. Tony, Tony, I think the question is like GPS trackers for localization. Oh, excuse me. I've never used them. Fair enough. Okay. Um, at this I thought you said vocal. No, uh, the, the question was voice lifting uh, slash tracking. Um, so the question was maybe somewhat uh, ambiguous. Um, well, anyway, but we do, we have a thing called click track where the conductor gets a, the beat and then something, you know, a voice comes on like in Wicked when the, uh, when her mother is playing around with the guy, dancing with the guy, he sings, have another, have another drink, my dark eyed beauty, blah, blah, blah. That's recorded because it's the wizard's voice. And the wizard, we don't see the wizard yet. It's the wizard when he was young, but that's not lifting. But yeah, sometimes you can, but as I said, actors equity would rather have you hire more actors to sing than have you record them and being played back with the other actors. I believe that was a big deal with river dance because apparently a lot of the, I don't know if they still do it, but a lot of the tapping was tracked and, um, got them some bad press. Ooh, yeah. So we have a question from Michael who is asking, what is your approach to stage foldback, particularly vocals? 
<laughs> um, I will say this. If you're holding a mic here or wearing a mic right here, we might be able to give you fold back. But if you're wearing a mic anywhere else, it just doesn't work. By the time we can get you enough vocal, I'm you, the actor, enough vocal of themselves on stage, we've already screwed the sound up. And I, I have a seminar that I do with two singers and a pianist. And I, one of the things I talk about it, it, are mic positions and we do lots of different things, but we also do monitors. And I let people, we start bringing the vocals up on stage as they're singing so, so people know what happens. This seminar was developed really for actors and directors far more than it was for other sound people. Because of course you get to that point where all of a sudden they're in a tunnel because the, their microphones are picking up what's coming out of the monitor speakers. And then of course it goes over the edge into feedback. And not to mention, but when you've got a stationary speaker here and a stationary speaker here, and maybe even one in the floor, you're moving around on stage. It's not like, you know, so it's, it's a really tough thing to do. And um, I've, I've only used in-ear monitors once. And um, I brought them to San Francisco for Wicked's out of town tryout because I'd never worked with Adina Menzel. And I knew she'd been in Rent and Rent was one of the loudest shows I'd ever heard in my life. And I thought that she might, you know, need something. And she never did. In fact, she wanted more orchestra. She was brilliant to work with. The first day that we did The Wizard and I teching it, she sang it full out eight times. And Kai and I got so much work done in the Korean theater that day because we had real vocal level. And, you know, it's, that's a hard thing to do, you know, and most, most performers will mark, as they call it, and not sing full out. When, of course, we could use that a lot. But anyway, she never needed it, and um, I've never used them since. And it's usually more about um, if you pay attention to the performer. I'm not saying lie to them, but pay attention to them. Check in with them at intermission. Check in with them at the end of the show if they're having issues with hearing. If you just do that and find out, usually I say, the first thing you have to tell me is, if you can't hear, what can't you hear? And if it's the orchestra, is it the time you can't hear or is it the pitch you can't hear? And generally, most actors will say, I don't know, I just can't hear. Um, and that means that they're not comfortable. And if I can make them comfortable, all of a sudden they can hear. So, so Excellent. on stage vocals. I, I, I would just throw in one quick um, on that. We, I, we did a lot of work with Pavarotti, the opera singer. Uh, and we did him in, in Arena and, uh, and that was John Benito, of course, uh, did that work as well. Yeah. Um, that's where I first met him. And um, <clears throat> we considered it the biggest mistake that we ever made was to bring up the fact that there was the existence of monitors. Because he's an opera singer, he didn't know such a thing as this. And somebody said, oh, here, here's the stage monitor. You can hear yourself coming back. And the guy loved it and ate it and wanted the loudest friggin' monitors of all time. And of course, it so damaged the transmission of the voice. Whoever the did that. Absolutely. And the orchestra as well. It hollowed out the orchestra. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, we ended up with six at one show one time, two overheads and four around him. It was crazy. It got so out of control. And when you were, Tony, when you were bringing up marking too, I mean, almost every, most rehearsals with Luciano were, uh, he was marking, of course. Yeah. Um, excellent. So, so we have a question of Evan, who is wondering how you deal with two actors in close proximity when the microphones start to face. Um, well, we go line to line. There's no more, unless more than one person is singing, we're talking, there's only one microphone on. And um, what I try to tell the actors and the director is, 
listen to my voice. Now listen to my voice with my hand in front of my face. See how it changes? Now, two faces getting together is just like my, my hand and my face. So if the closer they get together, the worst it's going to be, whether usually you find out, usually you end up using one mic if they're very close, but we try to keep them that far apart anyway. If they get a little closer than that, then it just sounds crummy. And you know, it's, there's nothing really you can do about that. I know some people use AB systems, but I've never found them to be perfectly successful at that either. So AB you systems, train? I mean that one, there'll be two vocal systems and you have two performers together and one actor will be through one vocal system and the other through another. But still that, that you know, acoustic sound of two faces together won't change, excuse me, won't change. Tony, are you training uh, Wicked Mixers uh, on tracks or uh, do they just sit with a, a show? Um, well, I don't train, I don't train Wicked Mixers. And <laughs> knock on wood, we rarely change Wicked Mixers. I mean, uh -huh. we have a crew on the road that's been out uh, in 10 years and uh, and we have a crew in New York. One has been there for the entire time and the others are there and they're very wow. happy. And I, you know, it's really, I'm lucky to have H in London who's been there for so long. Um, but training, Josh Maisel went out to San Francisco, we needed to fire somebody and um, this person was, uh, let me just say, thought to be dangerous. So they were going to fire him at one point, ask him to take his things from the theater and escort him out with security guards. So I needed to train somebody not in the theater who could then come in right away and, and learn as fast as he could because there was only one person who knew the show, the tour, just two contracts on the tour. And Josh Maisel took a live recording of the show, and he mocked up the VCA part of a Cadillac. And he mixed the show by himself after I think four days in San Francisco. Mm. Now, it usually takes three weeks. So he, he had spent so much time on homework that he was able to do it so quickly out there. So, but you know, it, where it's legal, Pro Tools is really helpful. Um, mm. Some, some of the companies have Pro Tools um, built in. And I remember giving notes once in Stuttgart to my operator, we were sitting backstage in the canteen having a beer. And I said, do you know the trumpet part at the very end of Wizard and I? Ba -da -da -da. And he said, well, why don't we go out front and we can do it. And it's so different there because this, the, the gear was still on. It's okay, you don't have to worry about it being after 11 o'clock at night. And um, we went out and we just, we mixed it because it was all recorded on Pro Tools, so. Um, Tony, would you mind elaborating, uh, elaborating a little bit about the where it's legal? Because I do, I'm, I'm not sure that everyone on the call is familiar with uh, the specifics. Well, in the United States, Canada, um, certainly uh, England, the, it's prohibited to record the show, um, to record the actors, to record the musicians. Uh, everybody knows we do it, especially to help people like a new sound op or a new performer who's learning. Um, but it's about unions and it's the same thing, you know, my union, I'm a member of local one, you know, they, they wanna be paid if there's a recording made, but those recordings that we make aren't used for sale. I mean, they're not good enough to be used for sale, like not for a record, you know, but um, that's why. Um, things have loosened up a bit in the last several years with all the computers because you can have a computer programmer sitting at home or sitting in the theater working, you know? And so if the union demands that that person be a union member, well, 
yeah, that's good. And it's good if they are, but they could also do it from home just as easily as doing it, you know, at the theater if what they're doing is programming. So, so they've lightened up a bit on that, but we don't have Pro Tools on New York or London. Just, it, and it's also a cost factor to it, you know. Just because we've run 17 years and been very successful doesn't mean we get everything we want. So, so Zach and H are both on this call. Right. right. <laughs> and and um, then Zach knows that very, very well. Well, so Zach, Zach, is, and, sorry, uh, Zach is commenting that um, um, allegedly um, they were able to record in a uh, full multitrack to prep for uh, the KDEC uh, Digico swap on the road for Wicked. Of course. Thank you, exactly Zach. Know that. Thanks, Zach. Um, so we have another question on the chat, um, uh, which is um, from Christina, Christina, and she's wondering how you recommend organizing the console outputs going to the signal product uh, processors whenever there are uh, separate systems for vocal and orchestra with um, 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 specific designations. Well, on a CADAC, and I'll talk about a CADAC just because I know it better than I know digital boards. Digital boards, you can send anything anywhere. But on a CADAC, we submix everything into sub submasters. And then from there, there's a matrix. And every single submaster, you can dial into any set of loudspeakers from, on that matrix. So if the line arrays, all the vocal submasters go to the line arrays and wherever else a little bit, the delays, Maybe they go into the orchestra system a little on left and right. Um, whereas the orchestra, we have a left, right, basically. And um, though I don't, yes, we have left, right, but I don't like to do stereo because stereo to me is backwards. Stereo is created to, to have live in your home. So if you, you know, we're already stereo in the theater. So I don't like have, I, I ask for mono keyboard mixes. I don't want different sounds from the keyboards going left and right, because it doesn't make sense. Because the people on the left side of the house are gonna hear the left speakers louder, of course. Um, you know, only one person all the way up the center who's ever sitting in the center will get benefit of stereo. So. And that's usually an usher. <laughs> In London, certainly, yes. Well, I, for one, am super happy that, we, that we're recording this and um, because that's, you know, it's like, wow. Um, so we have a question. Um, hi, Tony, Anthony Jones here. Is there a piece of gear that's currently out now you wish you had maybe 15 or 20 years ago? That's out now? Anthony, nice to hear from you. Um, Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> Leopards, Lena's. <laughs> you know, and I didn't even know I wanted them 15 years ago. But the, the thing that I really want, I asked John Meyer for about 20 years ago, was a speaker that I could sew into a costume. Um, and so far that hasn't happened, but I don't think John took me seriously. I do want to say, and, and that, I don't That would help that. I don't know when we say gonna... that would help that tracking thing that we were talking about. Exactly. Earlier. That's why. <laughs> Sorry. No, um, no, I wanted to say, I don't know when we're going to end this, but I just wanted to say, I owe so much to Meyer Sound that first time at uh, the Vivian Beaumont where I got noticed as a sound designer was a lot because we had seen the show. There's another time, I was the sound consultant for the Spoleto Festival USA in Charleston, South Carolina for six years. And there's different things every day, but there's always the orchestra at the Middleton Plantation, which is outside, it used to be a rice plantation. So it's all swampy. And as the sun goes down, all the animals and insects go up in level. And it's, it's a really, really hard job. But I wanted to get, the second year, I just couldn't get enough low end out of the system. And John suggested I try laying my four 
um, uh, what are, <laughs> I don't even remember model numbers anymore. The small, and fours? No. No, no, no. The no, small, no, like, like, like that's, 650. They're probably oh, 650s. That's the, and oh, subs. Yeah, USWs. USW. USWs. Four USWs in a line rather than putting two on two. And because it was, you know, the wave is bigger. And that year, we got such great reviews. In fact, one critic actually said, I can't believe the low ends, the basses in the orchestra sounded so beautiful outside. And I mean like, boink. And, and not only that, but I've just had so much support from you guys and Helen and everybody over the years. It's, it's really, um, enhanced my career i mean enhanced that's that words too 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 little but i appreciate it thank you thony um christopher dean thanks you as well he says great content great subject uh, thank you thony um so um does anyone on the call have any additional uh questions for tony or bob or john Manito? Okay, well, what about you, John? I, I motion to adjourn. I, I would second that. Um, I am looking forward also, uh, just, you know, the, we're gonna have uh, uh, a Wednesday and a Friday this week. So I'm looking forward to also continuing our theater week um, with uh, a couple of uh, more amazing sessions coming up this week. So, but uh, Tony, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having um, me. Yeah. This has been a lot of fun today. Thank you guys right. very much. You did a great thank presentation. You. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So also thank you uh, to my uh, fellow co-host today, Bob McCarthy. Um, thank you very much. Also for You're the um, for the 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 play bowls. Um, much appreciated. Um, John is leading these week's uh, webinar, so John is the one that is putting all the pieces uh, together and. Uh, so thank you very much, John, to you as well. And that means that uh, a recording of today's webinar, as always, can be found on the Meyer Sound uh, Thinking Sound YouTube channel. Um, in a couple hours from now, you will be able to view it over there. And that means that for those that joined us today, thank you for watching. Same goes for the people that are currently um, watching through the Facebook user community group. Um, thank you to you as well. And uh, without further ado, please stay health, healthy and safe and best to you and your loved ones. Bye-bye. Thank you, you too.